Corporate fraud works best in the shadows, behind corporate walls. How does the government bring these wrongdoers to justice? Whistleblowers. These are the stories of those who risk their careers to shine a light on allegations of fraud. Today on Fraud in America. Welcome to this episode of Fraud in America. For this episode, we're actually heading back to the University of Pennsylvania to speak with a, another Wharton professor. Uh, an earlier show, we talked to Professor Francine McKenna. Today, we're talking with Professor Daniel Taylor. Uh, he's the Arthur Anderson Chaired Professor at the Wharton School. He's the director of the Wharton Forensic Analytics Lab. He's an award-winning researcher and teacher with extensive experience uh, expertise on corporate disclosures, insider trading, and fraud prediction. He's a proud graduate of the University of Delaware, Go Blue Hens, also a graduate of Duke, where he picked up a master's degree and a PhD from Stanford, and he's been at Wharton for over 10 years. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Professor Taylor spoke with our membership in a, a really interesting session uh, discussing insider trading, uh, fraud detection. Uh, he was singing from our hymnal, uh, and uh, a lot of people are like, you got to bring him onto the show. So this has really been exciting uh, to have you on. A few weeks ago, we had Mark Pugsley, and he talked about Nikola Motors. He was the uh, whistleblower attorney. Uh, in the Nikola Motors uh, matter, uh, which I guess we're still waiting to find out what's going to happen with Mr. Milton, uh, how many years uh, he's going to get. Uh, but Dan, I, during the talk that you gave to our group, you mentioned private uh, the privatization of enforcement and the, the role that uh, journalists, short sellers, and private law firms uh, play in trying to help out the SEC. Can you talk about uh, that stool that you mentioned, that the three-legged stool? Yeah, so like the way to th the way that you think about things is, let's say that you've got fraud that's that's going on out there. How is that fraud detected and, and potentially brought brought to justice? I mean, there's, uh, you know, from the private sector, there's short sellers, right? So our short sellers write short reports, let the public know they put their research in the public domain. And if it's credible, stock prices will move. And if it's not credible, stock prices, you know, won't move that much. You've got uh, private plaintiffs, right? So you've got class action, you've got uh, brokey claims, uh, you've got various uh, private rights of private rights of action. Um, you know, if it's a, it's a Medicare or Medicaid fraud, you know, you can uh, take the use the False Claims Act. Uh, but for securities fraud, it's normally like a class action or something like that. And then the final one is whistleblowing. So those are your three avenues uh, if you are a uh, public citizen uh, to bring fraud uh, fraud to justice. You know, there's a fourth leg potentially in there that would be journalism, um, you know, putting it into the, into the press that would make other people aware, that would make the short sellers aware, make class action attorneys aware. Um, and then those are our three or four legs of private enforcement. And there's obviously the the big the big stick out there, which is public or which is, excuse me, uh, you know, our enforcement agencies, the SEC, the DOJ uh, and the government more generally. So there's some people who've been arguing up on Capitol Hill and elsewhere that we really don't need the, these three or four legged stools. But the government, it's this, the enforcement's the job of the government. They have all these tools and resources, unlimited resources to uncover fraud. Why is that not the answer? Why, why don't we just rely on the government to detect fraud? Well, I've never really understood that view, to be honest with you, because that view, like if, you know, if we're being honest, that view is typically espoused by free market, uh, free market individuals, individuals that are big, big proponents of market based solutions. And I'm a big proponent of market based solutions. And so. The private sector can generally do things better and more efficient than the government can, generally, not always, but generally. And that includes enforcement. Um, the private sector is not subject to government budget constraints. It is not subject to the government pay scale. It is not subject to government resources. You have sort of the best and your brightest are 
you know, for better or worse, are often found in the private sector. Or maybe, you know, lucky, if we're lucky and we cross our fingers, fingers, they have like a one or two or three year stopover in the government uh, on their way to greener pastures in the private sector. Uh, and so really, like, if you want efficiency for taxpayer dollars, what you should be doing is you should be deputizing, um, you know, the private market to basically, you know, solve the problem of fraud and to prosecute fraud. That would save considerable government resources, right? So you could imagine paying um, kind of like a whistleblowing bounty, very similar to, you know, False Claims Act, um, for successful successful prosecution. And in that situation, the government outlay is relatively small and private sector bears all the costs. You, you especially uh, focus in on uh, insider trading and, um, you know, in talking to people and preparing for this show and reading, by the way, head over to uh, the website for his Wharton Analytics uh, a lab. It is absolutely, and we'll add a link to it in the website. Once you go down that rabbit hole, just knock out the rest of the afternoon. It's really fascinating. Uh, the op-eds, the amicus briefs, the comments you filed with the SEC. Uh, just really fascinating work that you guys do over there. Uh, by the way, where were you when I was wandering the halls of Steinberg Dietrich in the nineties? Like this stuff, uh, you know, this is pre rollcom It's fascinating stuff you're in too. No, in the nineties, I was probably in high school. <laughs> okay. Well, that hurts. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so what is it about insider trading? Why do you find that so fascinating? Why is that your area of focus? So, you know, like I want to, you know, like back up a second. We think about, you know, maybe the, you know, what what many of us who are probably listening are interested in, you know, oversimplifying would be like catching bad guys or bad girls, so to speak, and bringing them to justice. And, you know, you know, we can talk about why that may be the case. It's probably deep, deep psychological conversations, maybe some nature, maybe some nurture, some life experiences or whatnot. But conditional on that being the case, for me, insider trading was so uh, interesting because as a researcher, we have data from these form fours of all of the trades of officers and directors. And so you can analyze all of those trades and you can look at the proximity of the trades to material events. You can look at whether they incurred inside a blackout window, whether they were 10 b five one plan or not. And so it was clear that you had very clean, very robust data. And so the inferences that you could draw were very powerful. And so in that sense, like if you can draw powerful inferences there, like that's where a lot of attention should be. And so I figured, well, if I could be an agent for change for uh, insider trading rules, you know, or an agent for change for fraud in general, you know, insider trading is one area where I can do a lot of good because I have clean, you know, very clean, very precise data uh, as an outsider. Um, you know, thinking about like corporate fraud or securities fraud, it's very difficult as an outsider to be able to assess, you know, like what's the likelihood of securities fraud or something like that. Like you can look at stock price drops, obviously, but, you know, you don't have access to the company's books and records. Um, you don't know what the board meeting minutes were, you know, but from an insider trading perspective, I can see every trade and I can mm. see all of the material events and then I can do it and line it up very carefully and very precisely and draw very clean statements and, and inferences about what someone knew, when they knew it, and when they traded. So maybe we should back up a little bit um, and give a little bit of a primer on, you know, people hear about uh, 10Ks, 8Ks, you spend a lot of time in the Form 4 world. Um, you know, what are all these dis corporate disclosures that people hear about? Yeah, so the 10Q... That's the quarterly financial statements. Those have to be filed every quarter. Uh, the fourth quarter ones are called 10Ks. That'll give you your financial results for the entire year. Then there's something called an 8K, and an 8K has to be filed whenever there is a material event. And there's, uh, you know, there's um, rules that are specifying what some material events are, like earnings announcements, auditor changes, management turnover. Uh, major contracts, but then there's also wide latitude in judgment that um, companies have. So do they want to disclose that they got a Wells notice? Do they want to disclose that their executive received a subpoena? 
Uh, do they want to disclose uh, that they're under SEC investigation? And those might be decisions that the general counsel of the company would make, that the information is material um, to investors, would alter their, how they value the company. And all, the, all of that would be disclosed on an 8K. So all of these disclosures are out there on the SEC's website. So people like me, you can suck them all down. All of the disclosures back to, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley 2002, if you really want to push it, you can go back to 1996. So you get all the disclosures. You get all the disclosure dates. And then the secret sauce is now that you have the date, you can do a loss causation analysis. And you can look at what happened to stock price within a few hours or within a day of that disclosure appearing on the SEC's website. And you can do that for every disclosure that's ever been filed. So if the stock price drop is large, you know, let's say a sufficiently large amount, let's just pick a number, 10%, then you, you would say, okay, well, that's a material disclosure in the sense that people looked at it and they said, whoa, either the stock price is going up 10% or whoa, and the stock price goes down uh, 10%. So that would give you a sense of what disclosures matter the most uh, to shareholders by looking at how prices change when the disclosures come out. And then uh, directors, officers, 10% owners have to disclose in a form four whenever they buy or sell trades, right? Am I getting that right? That's correct. Whenever they buy or sell their own company shares within two business days, they have to disclose that uh, on a form four. They don't have to disclose their trades in peers. They don't have to disclose their trades in anything else, just their own, their own equity. So common stock, preferred stock derivatives, warrants, you know, whatever it, whatever it might be. So uh, if I'm picturing this right, you know, you're able to chart this information and then go back and look at when those form fours are coming out. So if you're seeing a lot of trading ahead of uh, 8Ks hitting the, the wire or press releases hitting the wire, is that where you're zeroing in on possible insider trading concerns? Well, yeah, I wouldn't say we see a lot of that, you know, yeah. not Good. on wood, yeah. you know, see a lot of it. But that's the indicia, right? So the indicia is you see a disclosure that hits the news wires. You see that that disclosure causes prices to drop. And then you look back and you say, okay, who bought or sold a few days before this disclosure hit the news wires? And is this type of disclosure, um, you know, unexpected or expected? So unexpected might be like there's a bank run, right? generally speaking, probably difficult to predict bank runs or COVID, generally speaking, difficult to predict. But, you know, it's a material contract. Let's say material contract is is signed. Uh, and so it's good news. Did the officers and directors buy before disclosing that the material contract was signed? Because they were probably in the process of negotiating it over the course of weeks. Similarly, if there's an equity offering, let's say there's a, a large equity offering that's going to dilute shareholders. You don't you don't do an offering, an equity offering in seven days. Can't call up, you know, an investment bank, at least that I know of, and say, can we do a five billion dollar equity offering in five days? So if you see officers and directors selling before that's announced, it's likely that that they may be in possession of MNPI just by the nature of the transaction. Uh, so. You, you mentioned that, you know, sometimes in-house counsel uh, may decide not to notify the market that there's uh, that they've received a Wells notice saying that, you know, the SEC is likely to move forward on an, an investigation or an action. Oh, you know, as, as uh, someone who invests in the market, I would view that as material. But some of the courts have to say, have said that that's not material. Where, where is that line to be drawn? And is there a difference between the court? and the court of the market on, on what's material. Yeah, so this is what's really interesting to me and what sort of gets my juices flowing is this wedge between how financial economists and statisticians think about materiality and how the law thinks about materiality. Yeah. And generally speaking, you know, like there are, there, there are interesting, what I'm interested in is areas where economics says something different than the law. Right. And one of those is in in this notion of what constitutes materiality. So, um, you know, just so the readers have some background, I wrote a paper with some colleagues called Undisclosed SEC Investigations. 
And the SEC, uh, I don't know if they regret doing it or not, but they granted a FOIA that we submitted for all of the entities that they investigated over a certain time window and the investigations were closed. And so they told us like, we investigated this company from this date to this date. We investigated this company from this date to this date. So we had the data on the timing of the investigations. And so an interesting question was that we started out with was if you were internal counsel and you get a notice from the SEC, and it doesn't even have to be a Wells notice, let's say a subpoena. Do you clamp down on the trading of your officers and directors? Like if the SEC subpoenas you for books and records for potential accounting fraud, do you tell the CFO, hey, you know, probably don't sell your stock or, hey, CEO, hey, you know, don't sell your stock because we've got to subpoena. That's that's potentially material we're being investigated. And what we found was shocking. The answer seemed to be no. Um, what people were saying was, you know, people would say, well, oh, we don't really know what the outcome of the investigation is going to be. So we're not really sure, you know, or, or we're under investigation by regulatory authorities all the time. So if we were to clamp down trading, no one would ever trade. But that ignores the materiality point because you can have materiality in two regards. The first regard is, is it material to stock price? Meaning will stock price, you know, go down when it's revealed? So a great example that caused us to write that paper, Undisclosed SEC Investigations, was the Under Armour investigation. So a couple of years ago, it was leaked. And if you're interested in this, you can look. I gave some quotes uh, in the Washington Post article that talked about Under Armour. It was leaked that the Under Armour was on, under investigation by the SEC uh, for revenue manipulation. Um, and the stock price went down substantially once that became you know, known. And so it's like, well, clearly that's material because it was a loss causation when it becomes no through investigation stock price drop. So why didn't Under Armour disclose that they had subpoenas or disclose? Because they were communicating with the SEC during this investigation. And what we found out is, you know, we got this notion of, well, we didn't know that it was going to be bad. We didn't know there may not be any enforcement activity. And so you've got the materiality in price movement, which is downward. You also have materiality in risk. And so this is the piece that I think a lot of people in law, including the courts and lawyers, both plaintiffs and defense side, miss. You can have something that's material to risk, meaning you don't know whether it's going to be really good or really bad. But people are risk averse. They don't like risk. And so clearly the uncertainty has increased. And uncertainty is another word for risk, right? And so from our perspective, we thought that SEC investigation subpoenas Wells notices, which means the SEC is asking you why they shouldn't enforce against you, would be an economist, you know, clearly material by any economic definition of materiality. But yet there were court decisions out there uh, that we cite in that paper, papers titled Undisclosed SEC Investigations. Yeah. I think one was Lionsgate. Um, where the judge said, well, because there was uncertainty about what the outcome was, it didn't have to be disclosed. But now, you know, part of my training is accounting. I used to teach yeah. accounting 101. You disclose a lot in accounting, even though it's uncertain. Yeah, right. Sure. And so it's just this notion of, you know, where you have this variance between what's economically would be considered material, which is a lot of things that the law either case law, you know, or uh, case law generally looks at it and goes, meh, not really that, not really that material. And so I personally am interested in getting those two things aligned. So I would like to see case law, especially in this area, especially in materiality and in the white collar area, match the economics. So you've been doing this for a long time. You've gotten to see behind the, the curtain, uh, does it make you cynical about whether the market is fair? Yes, the market is not fair. <laughs> I mean, the notion that the market, I mean, it's its interesting. I had this conversation with one of my friends, you know, senior senior person in a regulatory agency. It's like, can we just dispense with this notion that the market is a fair and level playing field? Like, I understand that that's politically palatable to go out there and tell everyone that it's a fair and level playing field. But. Let's just like dispense with that because it's not a fair and level playing field. That now that being said, 
it may still be fairer and more level than other markets throughout the world. Yeah, fair. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't think that the public should be under this notion that that the markets are fair or um, or level playing field. In fairness, though, I don't think fairness. Uh, I don't think the public believes that. Uh, so, like, if you look at some uh, polls that, like, Pew uh, Research polling has done, you know, many people kind of understand that, you know, the market isn't fair, but, you know, they're still going to invest their savings in the market because on average, the stock prices go up, there's growth, economic growth is good, and that sort of rising tide lifts all lifts all boats. Mm. You know, this... Uh this time in which traders are trying to get every advantage possible. There, there was a company sold recently, I think, forget who ended up buying them, but their whole, their whole premise of the business plan was that they track corporate jets um, mm -hmm. for all these corporations. And they could tell you, you know, if this plane is flying out of this small town uh, airport that's near Under Armour or whatever, and they're flying to a competitors <laughs> near a competitor that are likely going to be working out some kind of deal and they'll trade based on, you know, just the, the flight information, That's but right. insider information, getting inside information from somebody, um, maybe a director or employee that has real time data. Uh, that's a line that's crossed, right? That's, that's really what you're looking at is trying to figure out where that uh, culpability is. But how do you figure out intent? I recognize, you know, analytics can point to the probability of being possible insider trading, but how do you get to that intent element? Yeah, I mean, that's something that the outsider generally can't do, uh, the outside data data analyst. You know, sometimes in rare situations you can. But, you know, like if you really wanted to bring a strong case, you're going to need, you know, internal records, emails. Uh, chat messages, you know, texts, you know, those those sorts of things. Like you can certainly establish a personal benefit to the individual from the behavior using analytics. But, you know, at the end of the day, which would be maybe indicia of intent or benefit, one indicia of benefit or intent. But, you know, to make the case, you do really need, um, you know, internal records and, and documents. It, earlier, we mentioned the Nikola Motors uh, example. You know, that was an example where there was a uh, activist short seller that was charting the outside world and, and released a report that really drove the price down. But the other part of that story that hasn't got as much attention is you know the whistleblowers who were who were on the inside, and some of them you used to work for Trevor Milton, who were able to provide some of that intent uh, information. So I, I saw on your website. Uh, by the way, uh, your personal website is also full of information. We'll send uh, put put that in the show notes as well. You seem to be interested in educating the general public about this. You're not in an ivory tower just talking to uh, Penn students. Why is that so important to you to to share this information outside the walls of Penn? Well, I think you know, I think part of it is going back to that cynicism. Uh, that I've picked up. Like the more and more I learn, I often wonder why is this the case? Um, so like one of my recent papers called Holding Foreign Insiders Accountable looked at the trading of um, corporate executives, officers and directors of foreign companies listed in the U.S. So like Alibaba, uh, AstraZeneca, um, you know, a bunch of uh, bunch of foreign companies that are listed in the U.S. These Cayman shell companies, you know, variable interest entities that are traded in the U.S. And what most people don't know is, is that all of those officers and directors are exempt from Section 16 of the Securities Act. So, like, the Section 16, which covers the insider trading of officers and directors, doesn't apply if you're a foreign company that's, in corp you know, that's domiciled elsewhere but listed on the U.S. Stock Exchange. Wow. So, like, in what world does that make sense? 100%. And I don't think it does. And so the question is, is why does that happen? And I've come to the belief that it's about education. So when I tell people this, the reaction is very similar to what you had. Say what? They, they either don't believe me or given, you know, they given sort of what I've accomplished, they're like, really? Yeah. And it's because people just don't know. You know, so like educating people that the market isn't fair, that doesn't mean that you should give up. That means that we should try and make it fair. 
Like we should try and close that loophole so that all of the entities that are traded on the NYSE and NASDAQ are subject to the same insider trading rules. That's just basic common sense. And the fact that we don't have that isn't because there's some corruption in the system. It's just a loophole that no one knew about. And so that's why you have education. A great example is, uh, oh, so you mentioned the website, Wharton Forensic Analytics Lab. You can Google it. Uh, my, my colleague, Rob Jackson, testified before Congress about that uh, holding foreign insiders accountable paper. Uh, I have on that website two talks that I gave to the SEC, one of which was on 10B51 plans, sort of like this perennial punching bag every five years. And no one had collected data looking at these pre-plans. So for those people who don't know, a 10B51 plan is when the the insiders plan in advance to sell their trades. And it turned out when you got the data, you had people who were planning that day to trade that day. And the SEC was saying, oh, there's nothing to see here. It can't possibly be insider trading because it's, it's planned. And it's like, but they pre-planned it in the morning and the trade happened in the afternoon. In what sense is that plan? Yeah. And again, it wasn't that the SEC was corrupt or something like this. It's just that they didn't know what was happening. And so when we educated the SEC, we educated the public, you know, there were lots of media articles written about this, you know, all of which were based on our data and our analysis. Wall Street Journal did a piece using our data and our analysis. And then people closed the loophole. So the SEC changed the rules. They basically said, look, you need to have 90 days, a minimum of 90 days between when you plan the trade and when the trade can can occur. And so. I think like if you're wondering why one reason is why the world is the way it is, if it looks really screwed up, it could just be an education problem. Now, I'm partial to that, obviously, because I'm an educator, but also because it 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 means that it's just about education. It's not about corruption. It's not about, you know, some sort of like evil mastermind out there trying to pull the strings. And so in, in that sense, it's a nice, convenient way to think about it uh, in terms of just educating people about uh, about these, let's call it dark corners uh, of our markets. Another one, last one, and then I'll move on. Just to just to give uh, your your listeners a sense of how much education is important, there are these paper forms called Form 144s. Now, I'd never heard about these things before COVID. These paper one four paper 144s is what everyone has to file if they want to sell 50,000 or more in unregistered securities. So let's say, for example, that you were a pre-IPO shareholder in Google and you wanted to cash out your pre-IPO shares. Uh, maybe you were the janitor of Google before it went public and they gave you some stock company. Well, your shares weren't necessarily registered in the offering. So you want to sell the shares, you have to file this form 144, there's an intent to sell these shares. Uh, foreign executives also have to file these. Everyone has to file these. Um, they were being filed on paper with the SEC. And so <laughs> now <laughs> 100,000 forms that the SEC yeah. was getting being filed on paper. Yeah. And so if you're curious, you can Google uh, or you go to the Warren Forensic Analytics Lab and look up the comment letter on 144. Or you can look at that holding foreign insiders accountable uh, paper. And we have a picture of myself and my team in the SEC reading room. It was like that scene out of Indiana Jones where they're putting the Ark of the Covenant in the warehouse. We've got the file drawer open, and we've got all of these paper 144s in there that no one had seen. But what was so fascinating about it is that Refinitiv and the Washington service were sending people to that reading room daily to scan the forms and then selling them to corporate clients. And so clearly the forms were valuable because someone was going to pay a courier to go there. Yeah. It's like it's like in 2020. What are we doing accepting paper forms? And again, it's not that someone at the SEC intentionally thought that the form should be on paper. It's just they had no idea. Yeah. They had zero idea that they were still accepting paper forms. And so we educated them and they did the right thing. And now form 144 is Ron Edgar. So if you've got some some data sleuths, look at the volume of 144s that are on Edgar now versus that were on Edgar one year ago. 
and you'll see like a 1,000x increase. And that's because the SEC changed the rules once we educated them. So, so Edgar's the online it. database uh, that anybody can go on. You can pull up uh, all the the forms, uh, 8Ks, the form fours are all in there. Uh, it's a it's a fun time. But you, but it does highlight a problem, right? I mean, the, the, the financial markets, the big cats uh, are able to recognize and use technology and the SEC's uh, playing catch up using Commodore 64 sometimes maybe. I don't know. Why now, is now we're talking are, are they not paying enough? Do we need to pay them more? Is that so? I think I, I think yeah. So now we can get into the structural problems. Why yeah. the heck is there this agency that's accepting paper forms? Why are they not analyzing these 10b51 plans themselves? Yeah. And so I think a lot of that goes to the structure of the agency. Um, I'm not sure that it's just pay, like in terms of paying them more. Uh, I think it's. I think it goes to the very structure of how the SEC is set up. So uh, for those that, of your listeners that don't work in, in security space, the SEC has five politically appointed commissioners, all politically appointed, three from the majority party, two from the minority party. And when the new party takes over, or there's a change in the SEC, you know, change in elections, elections have consequences, the heads of all of the divisions also turn over. So like the head of enforcement, the head of trading, the head of economic analysis, they're all politically appointed. Now you would say, well, they're politically appointed, but they don't get Senate confirmation. Yeah, the director of enforcement is not subject to Senate confirmation, but they serve at the pleasure of a politically appointed individual. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see turnover in these offices every four years or, or every eight years. It's very rare that an SEC commissioner, although lately we've had some, has actually risen through the SEC staff ranks. Mm. Um, so Caroline Crenshaw is a great example, and Allison Heron Lee, two uh, recent commissioners, are examples where you know they worked their way through the SEC up to commissioner. But typically the commissioners are appointed by you know like a Senate aide, you know, aide to Senator Shelby, or the the aide to the Senate Banking Committee, or or something like that. And so one has to think about whether that, I mean, that is the system for better or worse. Is that the most, the, the best, you know, the best process? I, I don't know the answer. Like I can't, you know, I can't come up with one that's obviously better. There's trade-offs to every single system. But now that you have those, that the political appointee and the head of enforcement uh, politically appointed and whatnot, you also have this procedure where the SEC has to vote. Those five politically appointed commissioners have to vote on every enforcement action. Every enforcement action has to be approved by those five politically appointed. Now, I'm not sure what other agency this is the case. Like, I don't know how, how much the DOJ works internally, but I don't think before they charge someone that they have to get five politically appointed people to, to, to buy into it. And then what's the what's their sort of their background? Most of them, Chair Gensler is an, is an exception. Most of their background is law, where they served in, as an aide to Congress. I I think lawyers are great. Lawyers are very useful. You know, they're very skilled at what they're doing, which is bringing cases and winning. Good lawyers. Yeah. But are they the best managers? Are they the best tech and data people? Mm. And so here's what I would say to any listeners. Here's how you can tell whether the agency, SEC, whatever it is, whether whatever government agency is going to be good at using data. If the head of their data analysis, and I don't know, what, to be honest, I don't know whether this is true with the SEC. If the head of their data analysis team is a lawyer, there's a problem. <laughs> 100%. Right? And so... Yep. If you look back at where the enforcement attorneys are drawn from, or the, the head of enforcement, director of enforcement, in this case, uh, Grubier uh, Graywall, he was from uh, Attorney General of New Jersey. But historically, they're dr drawn from the white collar defense bar. Mm. Now, I have friends who work on the white collar defense bar, and they're good, they're good, genuine people. I don't question their intentions. 
But it is interesting to think about when we choose a police commissioner for blue collar crime, we generally don't choose the police commissioner whose job it is to defend the bank robbers and the meth addicts and the drug dealers. But yet when it comes to white collar crime, for some reason, the head of enforcement of our white collar agency at the SEC tends to be chosen from the defense side. That's yes. always very perplexing, uh, very perplexing to me. We definitely want talented people, so you're definitely going to have a revolving door no matter what you do. But why does it have to come from the uh, from the defense side? And I do think the more that I get into my job and love what I do, and I know you know folks on the defense bar love what they do, the more you can see just how much you're exposed to shapes how you perceive certain pieces of evidence. When you see a piece of evidence, it's going to mean something different to somebody, you know, on the plaintiff side than somebody on the defense side. There'll be a benefit of the doubt or there won't be a benefit of the doubt. Um, and so, you know, my recommendation to the SEC was going to be the same recommendation that Harry Markopoulos had after the Madoff. Yes. Is the SEC needs to get rid of some lawyers and start hiring competent managers and competent data people. I do not think that they have really um, improved their detection capabilities uh, or their enforcement capabilities since the Madoff days. Now, it is true that they have analytics, okay, and that they have some um, analytic tools that they use to generate their leads. I'm somewhat familiar with those tools. Uh, there's been public reporting around two of the programs. Atlas is one for insider trading, and Artemis is another. These are like the market surveillance tools, right? So when you see the insider trading case, the SEC brings some, some buffoon traded out of the money, put options right before like a, an, an earnings announcement. If you're trading out of the money options right before an earnings announcement that's going to tank share prices, like you're going to get caught. Yeah. But now the question is, is, are those tools that they're using the most sophisticated in the private sector? The answer is unambiguously, unambiguously. No. How do I know that? Well, you know, I can't say with 100% certainty, but remember that they weren't looking at those 10B51 plan data, they weren't looking at those paper filing data, and so my suspicion is that they were, you know, modestly sophisticated, they would have been all over that, because that's their own data, right? That's data that they're getting from the issuers, and they weren't, they weren't even mining those. Um, so structurally, I think the SEC is set up for lawyers, it's run by lawyers, um, they've got lawyers that do the trial teams. Um, Jordan Thomas uh, has talked a lot about how the SEC needs to invest more in their trial teams. They've got lawyers who are doing the investigations. I think it's important to have lawyers that do the investigations. But when you look at who does really good investigations in the private sector, I don't know that many of the activist short sellers that are lawyers. You know, like Harry Markopoulos certainly wasn't a lawyer. You know, Nate Anderson wasn't a lawyer. Right. You know, and so the question is, is do we have the, the match of appropriate skill sets at the enforcement agency between the investigative function uh, and and the trial function? Um, I, I could not I could not agree more. And I certainly know Harry agrees with what you're saying. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier the role of journalists. Uh, you know, Wall Street Journal obviously covers this space very closely. Um, Investigative journalists are a dying breed, although you know, there seems to be bloggers and things like that are kind of starting to fill that void. Do you encourage your students who are interested in this area to go into journalism? If someone comes to you, one of your students after class, taking your fraud detection class, by the way, I would have loved to take in that 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> do you encourage them to, to explore this area? Or? So most of the most of the kids that I get by virtue of being at Wharton or in the analytics space are either coming from like business background or computer science background. Yes. <laughs> and so if you have those backgrounds, it's kind of rare that you'd want to go into into journalism. But I do have the students who are always curious, and I do have some people in class. I have a short seller come in every once in a while, and the short sellers always tell the kids, "Do not become a short seller. It's a horrible <laughs> life. Everyone hates you." You know, and you, you don't make any money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But there are lots of companies out there. You know, the big four, forensic oh. practices, chain analysis, blockchain, crypto. 
where you know there are actual good guys in the private sector, you know, yeah. and even you know you can think about this like white hat hackers as opposed to black hat hackers, mm -hmm. you know, who are trying to uh, you know prevent uh, money laundering, prevent crime, prevent uh, or trace, detect blockchain transactions that would be suspicious. And so I encourage a lot of the students if they want to do this sort of financial crime analysis to go that, you know, to go uh, to go that route. The journalism thing is interesting, right? Because you've seen yeah. it is dying. I agree with you. Um, you know, this clickbait idea, but you've seen a lot of great pieces out of ProPublica. I have to say, oh, they got some great. Well, I guess it was leaked data, so maybe I shouldn't say great data. They got some really interesting data from you know this IRS tax leak where they had all of the trades that yeah. the high net worth individuals made, not just in their own company, but in all of the peer companies. And they've just been grinding out piece after piece of how these high net worth uh, individuals are either you know playing games with the tax code or they're doing games with, you know, like super opportunistic, if not illicit trading that's been flying below the radar that I can't see because it's not filed on a on a public form only the tax authorities can see it so you know a lot of this stuff obviously isn't going to go away unless we increase the probability of detection right so that's right. how do we increase our ability to detect this kind of fraud especially insider trading so I, I think the first thing is is to have i think so i'd like to think this is what i tell myself when i wake up and, and i you know do my research on white collar, you know, crime or whatnot, and I do sort of, I educate, and hopefully people will get a sense of just how much is actually happening, but it's kind of like below the surface. Yeah. And then maybe there'll be more popular attention to it and people will be, wake up, right? Like you're starting to see that now in crypto, now that FTX was exposed as a major fraud and Alameda is going under and Binance is having, you know, issues, and Voyager and Celsius and all of these. And now people all of a sudden, skepticism is cool. It's fashionable. And so that, I think, getting society on board with the notion that there's actually this dark side of markets and that there's actually this illicit activity that's occurring underneath the surface. And so people should be alert to it, not only to protect themselves, you know, but if they're alert to it, they know it's happening, you know, tweet about it, write a blog about it, contact your journalist about it, whistleblow, you know, if it's if you're internal. Um, you know, these these sorts of things. So I think I think awareness of what's happening serves a big part in detection, because when you look at how, you know, the SEC and the DOJ operate in terms of securities fraud, they have resource constraints, right? They don't have, you know, unlimited teams. You know, the government pay scale pretty much caps out at like a quarter of a million. And so how do they come up with leads? And a lot of their leads, the data have borne this out, academic research has borne this out, not by me, by others, is that you see that the SEC tends to investigate after there's a class action lawsuit, after yes. you know there's a short seller report, right? Once the whistleblowing tip comes in. So it's not that the SEC is the tip of the sword. Far from it. They're almost yeah. never the tip of the sword. Occasionally they are, but rarely. And so if you want to improve detection, I think it's really about improving private the, the, the ability of the private sector to detect this and to put that information out to the public for then the SEC to scoop it in um, and to take action. One of the things that I've been told by many, many people from ex-SEC employees to uh, whistleblowers to short sellers is that if you if you have something you know, that, that the SEC is slow walking on or slow moving on, you have to shame them into action. And that mm -hmm. means, you know, talking to a journalist, getting someone to write it up, making it making it public. You know, like the, the paper filings. Once we made a yeah. big hubbub about that, the paper filings, they're kind of embarrassed, right? Does Gary Gensler really want to go in front of Congress and explain why they're collecting paper filings? or why the 10b-51 plans are being abused, or why we've exempted Chinese and Russian insiders from Section 16 of the securities law? No, he doesn't. Mm. And so if you could put it out there and start to alter the public narrative, then you're going to increase the probability of detection, and you're going to increase the probability 
of action uh, by regulators and by lawmakers. Amen. Well, Professor, I appreciate you spending uh, time with us. I hope everyone can share this episode far and wide. I know we have a lot of followers uh, in uh, the SEC and beyond. Uh, education is our mission, too. So hopefully we're uh, echoing your message as, as well. Until the next episode of Fraud in America, if you see something, say something. And when that doesn't work, make sure you do something. If you believe you have witnessed fraud against the government or fraud on the financial markets, we encourage you to visit our website at taf.org, where you will find a directory of member attorneys who represent whistleblowers across the country. On our website, you will also find additional information about our nation's various whistleblower laws and programs and a way to donate to our organization as we step forward in spreading information about whistleblower programs. This episode was edited and produced by Rachel Brooks, and our theme song is by Connor Chaos. A big thank you to our TAF staff and researchers of James King, Emma Bass, Jackie DeMar, Kate Scanlon, Max Boldman. Fraud in America is a project of Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund. The opinions expressed on today's show belong solely to the guest and are not necessarily endorsed by the organization. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Fraud in America.